do my own little study and um yeah um i'm very very interested in in the idea of objectivity versus subjectivity in in sound and um and um studying that and um i actually just wrote a <clears throat> article on my blog my 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 collector blog you should mention that yeah it's dgmono.com i guess i can write that into the the bar over here um and um I, I kind of address the challenges of record collecting in so many words and um uh that and this was kind of equally inspired by um uh a couple things uh there's a there's a a low a low budget sort of amateur documentary on youtube just called vinyl by a guy named alan zwieg i think is how you pronounce his name and um it's fascinating. It's like, you know, it's like an hour and a half or two hours. And um, he's a guy that lives in, uh, I think, Cleveland or Cincinnati in the late 90s. And, you know, he's got like a high eight camera or something. And he goes around and interviews all these fascinating characters that are record collectors. And um, he himself, it's a very confessionalist type of um, work. And um, it's really interesting. And then the other thing, the other book I read recently was called Do Not Sell at Any Price, uh, written by a a woman who's a journalist that, that occasionally writes for, I think, uh, The New Yorker. Um, and uh, she's a music journalist. And um, her book kind of delves into the quirky world of 78 collecting. And the last chapter is pretty much dedicated to the psychology of collecting. And I had I, never really seen something that is that focused about the psychology of all this. And that was amazing. I loved that. And I would love to find more out, out about it, just like you, Dan. Yeah. Is the one with the guy with the camera is that a is that a video series? I missed that part. It's just one documentary. It's like ninety minutes or one hundred twenty minutes or something like is that. Is it on YouTube? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, I'll 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 yeah, I'll, find uh, the link, please. Yeah, I'll create. I'll, I'll send the link right now in the chat. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Thank I you. I have a question for Rich. Yeah, sure, Rick. Um, when you trip. When you tran uh, with me, uh, yeah, I can talk. Really, I can. Um, you collect forty fives. When you get a forty five, do you transfer it to digital? Yeah, I've been doing that. Yeah, and and then put the forty five on the shelf or or sell it to somebody else. Uh, um, with the forty fives, I I keep the forty fives usually. I, I I'm more in the habit of reselling jazz LPs because they're so expensive. Okay. And, um yeah and when you uh when you do the transfer um you do your best to to clean it up and and no the, the junk or you no. clean it warts and all yep warts and all and you keep it that way yeah yeah the the intention of the the digital transfer is to two reasons one so i can get more familiar with the music uh because i use my 45s for djing that's um Part of the reason why I do that, and the other reason being that um, I use the audio for uh, YouTube videos that sort of feature my portable playing the record, and so the idea is to simulate actually hearing the record. So, okay, yeah. so <laughs> so you leave the all the uh, all the noise and the ticks and the pops and all that stuff right there. Yeah, yeah, and um, I actually just got a hold of some uh, plugins for noise and clicks, the uh, vinyl noise and clicks. So I've, I've just started actually this week. I just started experimenting with it. Uh, um, the the ticks and pops and warts. That's my least favorite part of of the whole uh, aspect of phonograph records. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, there's there's no question in my mind that um, I I can relax more and enjoy the music with the the better what I would what I call the better uh, noise of of digital mediums. Right. Um, I think it's and and I in a way I don't even understand the um, the debate between vinyl enthusiasts and digital enthusiasts between the two in, ter in terms of noise. Um, uh, and uh, I've read a lot about it. I've read a lot of the arguments on, in forums. And um, 
I mean, I guess a good way to conclude would be to say, you know, under those circumstances, why I still like vinyl and, and, and vintage records. And, you know, I think that it's, it's just, to me, I stopped using the word better when I, when I compare different pressings and different issues of a recording a while ago. Um, I really just, I think of them as different now. And um, listening to an original pressing is just a different experience than listening to a reissue. I, I, I would go on to say that if, if accuracy is a thing and it's like, and it's an objective thing in terms of like, if you're trying to make it so a duplication of a, of a master tape sounds as indistinguishable from hearing the real tape playing you know, in my opinion, a digital recording is way more likely to do that than an analog vinyl recording or, or a tape. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that being said, I still think there's value to yeah. vinyl and, and event original pressings. It's just, it's a, for me, it's an, an exhilarating experience, you know, when you get a good one, a good original pressing and um, you put it down and it, it, it sounds good and it plays. And um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so really my path forward with collecting largely is sort of like always having the two experiences to choose from. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Just, just, just curious, Rich, uh, you don't do any digital cleanup, but uh, what cleaning, if any, do you do physically to the records? Oh yes. Yeah. So that's, that's a good question, Luke. So um, what I'm in the habit of doing is, is <clears throat> um, I, I just, I, I settled on the spin clean uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I, the, the VPIs have not always been in my budget, although I've owned several of them. Um, I think there's something about the spin clean just being so simple and so cheap and doing such a good job that makes me kind of prefer it to a VPI. Um, but at the same time, like my precious blue note labels, there's something about the printing and the ink on them where I've had to create my own cover for when it goes through the spin clean. So the water can't leak on the label. Um, but, uh, but I, 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 when I take it in, I do a spin clean and, um, you know, wipe it off, give it a couple plays. And then I send it through the spin clean one more time. Uh, because in, in my opinion, in my experience, I, I do get better reproduction after I let it play a little, I guess if I had to hypothesize why that is, it's maybe because the record has been sitting for a while, playing it a couple times, loosen some more gunk from the groove. And then I clean it a second time and I get better performance. So. You ever play them wet? No, I've heard of that. <laughs> it I've helps. I've heard mixed response from that. Oh. I don't know. What was the mix? Uh, what? Uh, of responses. Sorry? Of responses. You oh, just that playing them wet is, is sounds good and playing them wet doesn't sound good. I've heard, I've heard both, uh, both takes. Say j just to put my half cent in, uh, I think if, at least in my experience, which may or may not be worth worth anything, uh, if records haven't already been cleaned well, it can definitely help. But um, I've got a nitty gritty, which is like a, a VPI, you know, va vacuum machine, and after doing around on that, I haven't noticed any difference with playing them wet. So I, th I, th hmm. I think if you already get them really clean at least in my experience playing them wet after that really doesn't make a difference hmm. interesting um i think rick's trying to jump in here as yeah there you go luke Bobby. you have a nitty-gritty yeah and you like it uh i guess I, I i get pretty good results with it i don't okay. care for using it but it, it does its job why do you not care for for using it well, it's just it's Messy? just a it's, it's just a pain. That's all. Um, at least what I do, and I don't know what anybody else does. Uh, I do, you know, I put on the uh, for any for anybody not who doesn't know what we're talking about. Nitty gritty and the, the VPI are vacuum cleaning record machines, and so you you basically scrub on a uh, cleaning solution, and then flip the record over, and uh, it vacuums it off. And so what I do is, uh, you know, scrub on side one, flip it over, vacuum it off, scrub on side two, vacuum it off. And then I do another uh, round uh, for both sides with distilled water just to 
try and get any of the you know extra cleaning solution out and it it works fine it's just it's a pain if you you know you want to play or transfer a record flipping back and forth four times and vacuuming you know vacuuming all that and it's even a bigger pain for 45s it's not really designed for 45s i make it work but it's mm -hmm. just i always kind of dread having to do it I'm, I'm glad i have it but it's i wouldn't call it fun oh it's labor it's labor man i mean yeah my intake of records is just totally and you know i don't know for for certain relative purposes insane you know, I have to do a lot to 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 decide if I want to keep a record or not. <laughs> I think it's a commitment. Oh, it's a serious commitment, man. It's a lifestyle. How long um, does that take? Um, I, I mean, well, you know, cleaning the record twice and listening to it, cleaning the record, listening to it, cleaning it again, transferring it, m mastering the transfer, uh creating album art for the digital file that stuff is all just that's a lot a lot a lot of work um uh i i have one more comment and then i have to go to the bathroom <laughs> so so then so then maybe we can switch over um yeah but uh uh well, what was i gonna say uh it was in relation to what luke was saying about oh so difficult to think so the um uh so there's the potential for me to do digital transfers of Rudy Van Gelder's record collection. Um, so that's sort of something I'm working on. And, um, you know, I just wanted to make the comment that like, as much as I love the spin clean, I would not use the spin clean for a project like that. Um, there's just no way that I would let that dripping water near the labels of those records. Um, so, you know, I'm definitely a VPI is definitely in the future for either myself and or the studio and the estate to invest in for that project. So, okay. So I got to run to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, come back. I'll be right and back. Okay. George, is your question for Rich, or can it be to the group? Well, I'd, I'd love Rich to hear it, but I okay. understand. Wait, Nathan then. Well, why don't I go with no. back Wait, then. Go ahead. Yeah. Wait, then. Why don't go I ahead, come, Rich. Back, in, go, I'll come Rich. back in 60 seconds? Go, go, okay. go, go, go. Right, hang on. Do, <laughs> he's here. He's here. Oh. Oh. Great. Right. Hello. Okay. Um, it, it was very intriguing to hear you, uh, as I know that you have an awful lot of, of vinyl records go through the cleaning process. I, I have, through trial and error and, and so forth, have, have developed something or have my own process I've, I've had a lot of success with. I use something very similar to the, to the vinyl. Um, it's called Vinyl Sty. It's a lot like the one that you use. The, 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 um, I can't remember what you called it, but I know what the one you're talking, a spin clean. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have one of these um, ultrasonic baths um, mm -hmm. and it, and it's helped me an awful lot. Um, it, for those, uh, you guys are probably familiar, but just really quickly, it, it's a, about 120 uh, kilohertz. Uh, it's a bath that creates bubbles at that freaking. So they're micro bubbles, they're small and they tend to penetrate into the groove and it's used in industrial applications. It's not black magic. It's, it's something that, that hospitals and industrial people uh, uh, applications, they use it to clean things and they really need it to get clean. And it's uh, at this frequency, it's, I have a, a bath that, that works very well for me. Um, what it doesn't do, obviously, is if, if a record's been misused and scratched up and it's you know been tossed on the bed and you understand, right? If it's physically damaged, I can't, I can't get that out. But I have had a tremendous amount of um, success using this bath. Now, it's not just the bath. I've also developed, uh, or not developed, but I mean, I've come up with my potion, right? It's a surfactant um, um, that, that um, there's a mixture of distilled water and, and turgitol and a little bit of alcohol. And um, when I use this, this liquid in the bath, I have had an extreme amount of success. And I just wanted to share that with folks. And to your point, Rich, I mean, I'm doing the, the, the vinyl style or the, the spin clean and I do the, the bath. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's an extremely, and I'm doing it 20 minutes in the bath. It, it's an extremely extreme amount of work. Mm -hmm. But I've revived that. And, and some of the things that I'm really, really kind of proud of is that I'll, I'll buy something that's kind of a VG, uh, I mean, a G plus at the store for $10. And I will try and revive it. 
and I've had an extreme good success rate, I'd say 80, 85% um, wow. reviving things and getting them to VG or VG plus. So I'm, I'm, I just wanted to share that with folks. Um, it is a, a, a long process, but um, I love to um, get problem children, you know, and, 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 and get them, you know, revive them. I, I kind of have a personal thing with the vinyl. So if I can revive it and get it to sound really nice, I'm real happy about that. So anyways, I just wanted to share. It wasn't really a question, um, but that, I've had an awful lot of uh, good uh, success with that. And um, I didn't spend a lot of money for the, for the bath. I have a very rudimentary one, but it, it, the principle works. It's, you know, it's not, it's not fake. It, it, it does work. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. That, that's fantastic. Um, I'll just quickly say that um, I have never used an ultrasonic firsthand, and I'm open to the experience. Um, and uh, I didn't realize until I saw the movie Uncut Gems recently that they use those things for jewelry, because there's a scene in Uncut, Uncut Gems where he says, like, yeah, put it in the ultrasonic. I was like, oh, that's funny. They do that for jewelry, too. That's so funny. <laughs> Hospitals use it for, for things that they use for operations. So it, it is not a frivolous technology. Um, it, it, it really is something. Uh, I, again, I have a, a rudimentary one. Um, some of these can go to four or $5,000, but I have mm -hmm. like a $700 unit that, that the physics Oh, that's cheap. Right? Wow. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, but it, it, it works. And again, some of it is the surfactant is really important to it. It, it decreases the surface tension on, 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 on a vinyl record in this case, in this application. So Tergitol, um, you know how if you put water on a piece of, on, on a piece of vinyl, it kind of bubbles, right? It, it doesn't really, um, it, it separates. But if you use a surfactant based solution with, with um, distilled water, um, it doesn't. The surface tension just goes really low and it just kind of slicks all over the record. And so it creates a, a constant um, surface tension and it allows the bubbles to get into the, to the, uh, to the grooves easier. So, you know, it's not just the equipment either. It's the, it's the Targetol and, and so forth. Anyways, um, George, what does it do to the label? Oh, that's interesting. So this particular solution that I have has these, um, how can I say? They're, they're like, um, they're similar to the, the weights that you put on top of a vinyl record, but they're a little bit bigger and mm -hmm. they have a gasket around them. So they kind of watertight the label. And now some labels are much more resistant to water than other labels. Um, frankly, I find that the, the more the, the, the more classic uh, blue notes and, and so forth, the prestige, you can get them wet and they're not going to really have a problem with it. But maybe 70s Atlantic stuff, you know, you, you might see a little bit of damage uh, from the water. But what I found is that after that happens, when I go and play it, I spray it again with a spray bottle and I make the entire label the same consistency and just let it dry. And so now it's just uniform because what happens is when you, when you clean it and the gasket, if it leaks a little, maybe there's warpage on the, on the vinyl, right? So it doesn't make a hundred percent contact. It may leak a little bit, but if you make the wetness uniform, now it just looks like one unique, you know, it, it doesn't have the gradient anymore. Um, yeah. It's kind of crazy what I'm doing, but that's kind of how I get around it. But that's okay. a good question. Yeah. It does leak a little bit. It does, Great. especially the more the more warpage there is on the record. Yeah, because yes. it's complete submerging. Yeah. 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 You. You. Well. Yeah. It. It kind of. It's like a, a robot arm that goes into the bath and it kind of spins. Um, mm. and, but yeah, you have to get it into the into the runout, and so it can you know, it can get uh, it can get a little wet depending on how warped it is. And I could see how you can do that to your stuff, but how Rich would want to totally avoid that, dealing with Rudy Van Gelder's personal collection of, course. of yeah. historical documents. There must yeah. be a way to, to get that seal better, right? I'm just using, you know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not quite... Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. But yeah. I, I want to move along here. Yeah. Okay, And thanks. I got one question. 
Oh, um, for George, um, Turgitol, you T E R G I T O L to you, probably maybe. I think it's 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 O L, you're correct. Um, it's a T-E? surfactant, it's, yeah, it's a chemical term for for surface t- attention. Um, there's there's a couple of them, um, that I use in, in a mix. Ever um, use photo flow? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, what is that? That's a um, um, a wedding agent that's used in photography. Probably has a similar application, surface tension. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. And probably yeah. a, a a much lower price. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Because there's oh, no magic is, to it. <laughs> what is it called? Photo flow. Okay. P h o t o f l o. Okay. Photo. And it's Kodak. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Are they still in business? Somehow. <laughs> wow. <Cool. laughs> yeah. All right, Rich, do you want to say any final words here about this? Uh, no, I just, I like, I hope that I have the opportunity to continue along this path of exploring the psychology of collecting and audiophilia. So um, I thank hope you so for too. everybody for being um, a part of this with me. This was absolutely fantastic uh, with, all of the, uh, with all of the um, unexpected things and uh, successes all 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 inclusively i thought it was great so thanks again for the opportunity dan me too thank you and we're going to be doing this till september so i let's talk about when do you want to do this again i mean this okay. was really wonderful cool and it's fantastic meeting the new people here so with that and actually that's a good segue let's go into who everybody is and uh, so introduce yourself, please, and you'll unmute yourself and uh, say what your name is and what you do in audio, what your audio connection is and where you are and uh, that kind of stuff. So let's start with, uh, Rich, why don't you just say, start with you, where you are and what you're what you're up to, and we'll just go across my screen, which is you, me, Akko, Rick, Janie, Lou, and then we'll go from there. Okay, yeah, um, I'm uh, I'm I'm in uh, Queens, New York. Uh, right now, I'm technically upstate near near Albany, New York, but um, I live in Queens, and um, uh, I I I'm collecting record collecting is a big part of my life. Music's a big part of my life, and um, uh, yeah, I just continue to do my uh, research on Rudy Van Gelder and have my relationship with his studio and estate, and that's really exciting. So uh, that's where things are headed for me. Great, thanks. And I'm Dan Mortensen. I'm in Seattle, Washington, and I do theoretically do sound for concerts, but I'm working full-time basically for the AES, whether they know it or not, working... Uh, on this stuff and editing videos and posting those and uh, working on the convention that's going to be in the fall. Akko, your turn. And now, uh, what, what's your name and where are you and what's your connection to audio? So un- unmute yourself. Oh uh, you yes, um, um, I'm just um record correct uh, from um Japan, and I chiefly uh collect collect uh japanese pressing jazz record and um yes and um uh, actually i i i've got i've got um interview uh by richard so if you visit his uh website uh you can see the <laughs> my <laughs> interview so and uh, maybe i don't need to explain here and then um, yes if you have a time uh, to visit his website and read many many uh, interesting articles uh, there are many many interesting articles so yes um, yes I'm just a small collector not big oh yes that was you in that interview that's a good interview he's a good interviewer Rick Rich is a good interviewer ah uh, yes um so many uh, not not only me uh, many Yes. Uh, very good yes. collector. Uh, got interviews, so you can compare the <laughs> uh, interviewer. So yes. And so, what part of Japan are you in? Um, I live in a Gifu, it's a, a dead center of Japan. It's a small prefecture. 
great. Yes. What time is it there now? Now is a Sunday morning, 10, 10, 10 a.m. 10, 10 a.m. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. This is really great that you joined us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Rick? You're muted. There, whoop, now yeah, you're I got to find the unmute button. I'm Rick Chin. I live in Sammamish, which is a suburb of Seattle, and I'm the webmaster for the AES PNW section. <clears throat> Otherwise, um, I'm a, a location recording engineer, and I do circuit design and make circuit boards like that. Oh, yeah. Um, and That's one of those disappearing ones. Yeah. Here. <laughs> <laughs> there, how's that? Makes, makes you disappear altogether. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> um, well, you know, I could uh, I could get rid of the uh, the, f the phony background. No, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. R Rick, your public wants to know what's under that windscreen. Yes. Oh, it's a Audio-Technica ATM 450. It's a side address, small diaphragm mic. It's under 200 bucks. Um, I saw it in the cat in I saw it in the catalog and said, "Oh, I think I need to have one of those." <laughs> so now I have one, and I've yet to use it on something. Um, you you you've used it on this multiple times, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, it sounds good. It's it's not as pretentious as using a U87. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right, thanks. Janie? There, there's my mess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like mine. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I'm Janie, and uh, in better times, I record live music, um, although I have been uh, contributing to what I hope will be uh, a live uh, CD by the Purs that you got a snippet of last time. Great, thank you. And you're in? I'm in Seattle, sorry. Thank you. All right, Lou? Hi, there's my mic. Uh, I'm Lou Coley. I am a wild audio technician, uh, not associated with AES or anything else. I'm just some random person. Uh, I live in Olympia, Washington, and um, I had a house gig here at a performing arts center, and now I am uh, wildly unemployed and uh, learning to live stream and trying to start up a new business. All right, great, thank you. And you are part of the AES. You've been coming to stuff now for a while. Well, sure, you know what I mean. Yeah, I'm yeah. not a member. Well, I'm just talking to everybody else. Okay, Gordon, and then Gary, and Luke, and George, and Barry, and Tommaso. Gordon, unmute. Not yet. Course, there you go. You. Right there, you there go. we go. I am Gordon from Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, me, I just do audio and stuff like that. I've been doing it for many, many years. Uh, I tend to live at the other end of the record collector. I'm more interested in how it's done than listening to it, frankly. Uh, though that didn't stop me from having something like three and a half thousand red LPs at one point. <laughs> All right, thanks, Gary. I'm Gary Louie. I'm in Seattle. I am uh, the recording guy for the University of Washington School of Music, and I am the uh, AES Seattle or Pacific Northwest section secretary, and I'm the uh, uh, chair of the what's called the Tellers Committee for AES headquarters, and I'm an AES Life member. Congratulations. Hey, Luke. Uh, Luke Pahalski. I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm a software developer by day, uh, kind of hobbyist, recording engineer, live sound engineer, uh, uh, mastering engineer, uh, <laughs> show promoter, whatever. So uh, just audio hobbyist with spends lots of money on microphones. <laughs> All right. Thank you. George? Hi, I'm George Bueso. I'm in the New Jersey, uh, northern New Jersey area, close to New York City. Um, I'm a, by day, I'm a cellular microwave network um, engineer for AT&T, um, your cell phones, and 
every other chance I can get. I, I'm a audio enthusiast for life and I collect um, jazz and house and funk and R&B and anything else I can get my hands on that's, you know, quality music. Um, I have I'm also uh, an enthusiast with the, the equipment that I get uh, to reproduce the sound. Um, and I, I truly believe in uh, just going downstairs and, and doing some critical listening. And, and that, that's my claim to, to audio. I, I don't work in the field, but I just love it uh, as, a, as a, it's more than a hobby to me. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Barry. Barry, are you there? You haven't spoken before. You're muted now. You need to unmute. Well, maybe Barry isn't even there. Tommaso. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Tommaso Gambini. Um, I'm from Italy originally. I moved to Boston in 2011 to go to Berkeley, and I've been living in New York City since 2015. I'm a recording engineer and a musician. I also enjoy designing uh, audio equipment, and uh, my connection with Dan is through my involvement with the Van Gelder Studio. And I'm curious, Rick, what that uh, PCB was that you showed us. <laughs> it's there you go. It's um, it's a uh, eight-channel view meter driver and uh, peak blinky board and it's going to get installed in Bob Lang's SSL. Hmm. Excellent. And we're doing we did it in multiples of eight of eight channels. Cool and you decided to go for pretension. Yeah I did. <laughs> All right great thanks everybody that is my favorite part of any meeting that we do almost other than the content I just love hearing what you're all up to and where you're from and it's so cool that you decided to join us and I should say that uh, we will be doing this every week and maybe now we need to decide what we're doing next week does anybody have any thing that they want to prepare and for a week and tell us about next Saturday and I'm and don't say it all at once but if there's something that you want to share something that you love or you learned that was interesting and want to talk about for a little while that's how this works that is the 4th of July holiday isn't it oh it sure is does that matter anymore yeah I mean it is 4th of July yeah yeah. Is anybody going away for the 4th of July or doing anything? I do have plans myself. Okay. Um, yeah. Do we want to skip the 4th of July? I'm totally open. I don't want to come and be by myself here. Who wants to who wants to skip the 4th of July? Raise your hand. What what day is the 4th? <laughs> Saturday. Oh. It's... Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Okay. Everybody else okay with that? Yeah, that works for me. Okay. Gordon, you're okay with an American holiday? Yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so okay. well, we're, we are celebrating our independence from the people south of you. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not. That, that's the weird bit about it. You're actually celebrating your independence from Glasgow because Glasgow owned the tobacco barns. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So I guess this well, is then in that case, we're celebrating our independence. From, yeah, we're celebrating our independence from the lot of you. <laughs> our our from change of status from a colony. <laughs> On that subject, um, have you guys heard of Soundfield microphones? Do you know what they are? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, see when we're messing around looking for um, all the stuff to do with them. Um, a Live Aid concert, I discovered a couple of articles that sparked off um, you chasing around how the, the sound field microphone was developed. It's got quite a story. I don't know if any of you know the actual story, how it got developed. Um, I could probably resurrect some of the stuff off of that if you want. That'd great. be great. So yeah. we're talking two weeks from today then. Yeah, there's a so lot of yes, stuff Gordon? in the AES journal from Michael Gerzen about right. it. Right. 
a certifiably smart guy. Yeah. Oh yeah, I actually met I met him and I've I've used I don't own one anymore, but I've used Soundfield microphones pretty extensively. Um, for a long time, it was the only way that was accepted to record uh, radio broadcasts of um, orchestras and stuff like that. So I ended up using them quite a lot, especially the early versions, and they were great fun. I love playing with them. Okay, so that's two weeks. Anybody else for two weeks from now? So Dan, yes. Um, I've got a couple of uh, recordings that, from my era at Eagles, and oh yeah, uh, maybe I could um, do something short on that. Great. Part of my plan is to do a talk about Eagles and Boyd Grafmeyer and the Seattle Pops Festival, because uh, I've I've been finding a lot of stuff about that. Um, but I'm I don't I might be ready two weeks from now. I'm definitely not ready for next week. But you want to it, put our two things together? Yeah, maybe. Maybe okay, that would be well, good. Just get in touch with me. Okay. I know how to reach you. Funny that. Yeah. Anybody else want to do something for two weeks? Okay. Let's go to Lou. All right. Everyone hear me okay? Yep. And let's go ahead and make sure you can see me, because I'm not going to share my screen. I'm going to play around with this fun uh, live streaming software. So hi, I'm Lou Coley. Here's my presentation. This will be fun. Um, so I did analyzing Zoom and other teleconferencing platforms. Uh, this was sending audio through Zoom and FaceTime. Can you FaceTime. pause you for a second here? Yeah, of course. Everybody go out of gallery view and go into... Or, or whatever you'd like. You can spotlight me if you like, Dan. Oh, so right-click on my video and click Spotlight. And then that'll spotlight for everybody, and I should be on screen. Oh, Dan? I figured I'd, I'd go there. Looks like Janie's still there. There we are. Hi. Sound plugged in. I'm down here. That's fine. I, I don't really have much audio examples in here. It's more about the, um, the data I got through Smart. Everybody cool? Everybody seeing me? I hear nothing. Yep, I see you. Oh, okay, great. I see you. All right, moving on. Um, so I ran some audio through Zoom and FaceTime and Jitsi and a couple others to see what the frequency response is and the latency. Um, but let's start with me. Uh, I'm Lou Coley. Uh, I want to tell you a little about what my background is so you're seeing the lens at which I'm seeing quality and what I really care about and what I don't care about. Um, I was uh, an audio engineer for the military band for about 13 years. Uh, before that, I got a jazz degree at uh, Shando University, so um, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Um, and also, I've always been a live engineer. I, I did some recording work, but it's always been live. So that leads me to believe a few things about the audio source. Uh, the simplest route is always the best. It's always going to be the least you can do to it. Uh, and this is live. This is my opinion. It has nothing to do with I'm not a heavy, I, I can critical listen, but it's just not my thing. Um, so I understand I'm, I'm a bit different from most folks that might be here. Um, but when I'm working live and I'm, I'm thinking about audio, I want to keep it as unprocessed as possible, remove the things that are audio, the things that we've done to it that make it not sound like it originally sounded like. Uh, additionally, mono is best for live sound. Um, people will disagree with me on that forever, but I believe that mono is the best experience uh, for a live sound uh, situation. Uh, that being said, that's how I measure. That's how I um, look at program when I'm thinking live. I think of a recording as a completely separate medium. Um, it's not, it's like painting and sculpture. It's just two separate things to me and they just don't overlap very much to me. Um, so those are my opinions. Anyway, so that's what I used when I'm thinking about uh, measuring something and using SMART. So uh, let's see. We're going to pause there. Is there anything, any thoughts on live sound and um, the things I've said so far? I'm sure people are going to disagree with me a bit. I'll agree with you and say that uh, without extraordinary preparation and resources, it's very difficult to do stereo live sound because everybody in the audience is going to hear something different. And that's my feeling about it. It's more about coverage, and I'd like people to really only hear one speaker, if at all possible, because that's the purest sound. Yeah. There's no real stereo in nature. It's just we hear things in stereo. 
it's nice having stereo available for effects. Certainly, uh, and, and that can keyboards help. Keyboards and stuff like that. Sure, I, I honestly don't really use it, um, and that's just that's just my personal preference. There's no right yeah. answer here. Correct. All right, uh, let's see. Where was I? Uh, let's move to what's next here. Uh, okay, some so other people yeah. wanted to say. Yeah, some stuff. please chime in. Let's go. Yeah, I just I just had a quick comment. Uh, just that um, 20 years of DJing experience, and uh, in most of my my situations, private private events and club settings and bar settings, you know, the speakers are close together, even if they aren't, I mean, if they aren't close together, it's even more of a reason for mono in my opinion, but mm -hmm. um, no matter what the circumstances are, I've always, it's always made sense to me that, that I should be sending it out mono with, with DJing. So that's my experience too. Right. And speaking more to the critical listening we were doing earlier, um, it's really, you have to control the environment and the variables and everything so much that it just gets to be impossible, especially if you're trying to do it live or over the Zoom thing or anything else. So I look at that kind of art as um, its own thing and to be digested a different way. Um, but again, these are just opinions. And Rick had a question. Yes. Comment. Uh, comment. Um, I, w I worked at Seattle Center for 20 years. And one of the features of the Seattle Center Opera House was a three-channel stereo system. We had left, center, right. It's important to notice to note that in any multi-channel system like that, all three channels have to cover the whole room. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you get the problem that that you mentioned, which is not everybody hears the same thing. But I mixed a lot of shows there in st in three channel, and I think it makes a good difference. I, I, I will agree with you, that, um, and here's, here's my caveat, is um, using as, them as decorrelated systems um, to then be more of a canvas. So like, if, uh, and this is what the new um, live sound of the virtualization and the larger soundscapes of all these processing that's coming around, where if you put just vocals in the center, a lot of Broadway acts do that, or um, you only put band instruments in one PA or Dave Ratt did a tour where he said two full PAs uh, on either side and he would do kick, snare, bass and vocal in one and everything else in the other to give it the separation. This is the Grateful Dead wall of sound concept. Yeah, I, I did things like I would put the vocals in the center because that made the most sense and then I'd use center left, center right and left right as mm -hmm. separate stereoscapes. Interesting. And, and it worked well. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. It can be fun. It's just never something I've really delved into. I never, I, I spent more of my time focusing on that. And I just think that's the way to go. But that's, again, there's no right answer here. Yeah. Your mileage I, may vary. Yeah. Right. I, I will say that I had a, a center cluster in a music club, the backstage. And I, I felt I needed to do that to use a limited number of speakers to couple them together to get enough oomph for what was going to be required. And it worked fine for the oomph part, but there was never any way, no matter how much reverb or ambiance you added to the sound, there was never a way to get it as rich sounding as two speakers spaced far apart with the same sound coming out of them. I, and, and I decided that it's because our ears are uh, wanting to hear that scrambled mess for music, <laughs> whereas for clarity for voice, you may want a setter cluster uh, to give you single arrival times with everything. But with music, mm. having that gamish of swirling stuff is enjoyable so there's a there's a comment sure and and, and maybe that uh, warrants it uh, as far as that but I, I again I it's so hard to control as far as um, in a live setting so that's why I've kind of abandoned the stereo idea um, but in in hearing a stereo system in, in a controlled environment like I have a decent hi-fi here and it sounds great, and I want to listen to things in stereo, but uh, if I was to mix on it, I don't think I would really try and do that. And again, I'm speaking as a live engineer, and that is all I've ever done. 
Uh, but you don't, I don't set really up a, a single cluster and expect negative. That no, to I be... do. I do spread out the horizontal, but it is yeah. the same That's um, what I'm signal. Saying. That's right. What I'm oh, you're saying. saying. Oh, right. Okay, gotcha. You're saying that exact thing. Right, and we are more sensitive in the horizontal than we are vertically, so that's why mm -hmm. when you spread it out, we'll want to hear that, whereas, you know, mm -hmm. when you hear multiple array elements, you don't hear as much of the vertical dispersion. Anyway, uh, let's move on. Uh, let's talk about uh, SMART. So, what is SMART and what does it do? Um, it is an audio analyzer, and you've probably seen the one like um, Rich was using earlier. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up smart here. So here we are Go away uh, This is smart and you've probably seen a single channel and let me go ahead and turn on our generator and you can see What that looks like here I'll turn down the music. This is just a track. Well, we'll turn it up a little so you can hear it but this is what the um, Analyzer looks like this is a in time. This is what you're probably used to seeing This is just a single channel so it's just seeing exactly what the um, data is. And then here it is again in spectrogram. You can see it passing in time. It's as if we're viewing that RTA um, straight down and it's passing us um, in the vertical domain. Everyone getting that so far? What kind of generator are you using that outputs music? Uh, you can get it to play a file. Huh, uh, okay. it's, in the, it's built into Smart. Uh, you can also make it pay, play Pink Noise, but right. I find Pink Noise super annoying. Cool. Um, and then uh, so you can see all that in there. Uh, and then so let's move on back to my presentation here. Boink. All right. So here is a single channel uh, measurement. This is straight out of Bob McCarthy's book, The Green Bible, uh, Sound System Optimization. Uh, and so this is where our single channel breaks down with an RTA. Uh, we have one mic, but we don't know anything else, or we only have one point of data, and we can't really compare things because we, we don't know things about time, we don't know things about um, who is affecting what, and you can see there's a lot of question marks on this screen because we, anything can pass through that system and change it, and we don't know what's going on. So there's, there's our real issue. So we move on to, oh, here's the Green Bible. Uh, this is a great book. It's in its third edition. Um, Bob is really the only one that's written a huge comprehensive book on this so far that I've seen that is um, really live sound focused. It's, it's a great read if you're into this kind of thing. Um, let's see. And then, all right, so here is the transfer function. What we want to do is compare our source to our data so that we get more accurate data. We now get time of arrival, we get um, what the response is doing with the device under test. In this picture, it's a speaker. Um, and we also get just more accurate data overall. We can get phase, which is, uh, you know, in relation to time. So in this uh, example, this is just a single two-channel measurement. You were sending signal out. That's the blue line. And that goes out through whatever signal your, um, whatever device you want to test overall. In this case, we're just uh, concerned about that speaker in the, in the uh, upper graphic there. And then we have a measurement microphone. That's the second input. And then that will do a transfer function. It'll basically divide the source from the data and tell you what the difference is. And this is a huge thing to know um, because you can correct the device under test. And you can get down to every single device in your chain and see exactly what it's doing. So let's see here. Uh, here we go. So this is more of the two-channel idea is uh, the first graphic you can see if the speaker has a mid uh, bump in the middle of it and your analyzer mic picks it up and it divides that out, it shows the, um, the bump in the uh, frequency response. Second one, there's an electronic device creating. That's an EQ just creating a filter. And we'll see it the same way. It looks the same way. Now, uh, on the third example is the kind of correction we can do is if our speaker has a mid-raise and we uh, have an EQ that's the exact inverse of that, we will get essentially the um, equal amplitude response on the output. Pretty cool, and it makes it so that it, if you can get your um, audio system to behave the most like a cable. Uh, that is the goal here. Uh, so... 
let's go ahead and stop there. Anything else I need to clarify on SMART and what it does and how to read it? Hey, Lou, uh, nothing technical, but I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same for everybody else. Uh, I don't know if it's because of the the way you're you're kind of casting or what, but the text is barely legible. It's really kind it's of all right. It it's really doesn't matter. It's more for me to know where I am. Oh, okay, because uh, I was just like I, just, I could I could read it, but it was right. Like, it was, it was more uh, the graphic I was concerned with, um, and I don't know if you can see the kind of frequency curve here. I'll see if yeah. I can't put my mouse on that. It is fuzzy, but it is legible. Right. The and it's that's special. not really my concern. Uh, as I was just talking about the the curve and how it, um, what we can do with this data. Good. Hey, Dan, Janie is asking you to check your chat. Thank you. All right. So uh, where are we next? Uh, let's talk about the setup that I use to measure Zoom and um, all the other stuff. So it's the same idea. I put the, as if you were measuring a microphone or measuring a speaker, you have uh, your microphone or your, your receiver end, uh, and then the speaker is what we're sending into Zoom. So basically it'll look something like this. When you add Zoom into the mix, I'm transmitting out the data I wanna see go through Zoom, and then I'm receiving it with a second device that's connected like a call, and then I'm receiving it as the measurement um, input so that becomes uh, what what we sent out is what we're what went through zoom and now what we're getting back is the data we want to look at uh, and then when you run that through smart it starts to look like this which is really great so this is the um, frequency response I got with um, this one was zoom so you can see there is a pretty substantial roll-off starting at about 125 Hertz I know it can't be really red right now but I can see it pretty clearly uh, because I have two screens. Uh, and then it kind of drops off right there at about 15K. Uh, that high mid, or the higher stuff at like six or 7K, that little bump is a product of the headphone out of my iPad. When I switched to another device, it was more flat compared to other outputs. So it really goes to show all these devices will give you a slightly different frequency response, which again, really makes it so there's no critical listening to be done because we just have no comparison. Uh, let's see here, where do I wanna go from that? Ah, we're gonna play the, the latency thing. So uh, let me go to this. So here's what's going on. Uh, there is, what we wanna look at is that top response, that first uh, spike that keeps kind of moving around uh, and that is the latency here let me move to that so you can see here there's that latency moving around and that's what zoom's doing it's constantly changing the amount of latency fortunately this is a small window that it's working with um, but a lot of the other ones like Jitsi and FaceTime and and uh, what was the other one I tested Skype and they would have 100 millisecond swings and when you're hearing something like that and then it shifts another direction that can cause a doppler like thing where it slightly pitch shifts um or you're just hearing time and if if it's uh depends on how you hear it how quickly it changes latency um and how fast that all happens it's it's very strange and i'd like it to stay locked but it just does not and no service does so this is it adjusting to I guess your internet speed or the processing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I will note that it did get lower latency by about 100 milliseconds when you disable, that's my son, uh, the original sound. So when you have no processing, obviously there's going to be less latency. All right, let me go back to this. This was the transfer I got with Jitsi, which was my personal favorite as far as audio. Um, very flat response, uh, much more low end. It, it didn't start rolling off to about 80 hertz. Um, and then was a much more gentle roll off up top. Uh, this was my phone output, which was a little more flat as well. Um, but this just measured better. It had a more stable latency. Uh, but the bummer was um, that when you broadcast to other users, you couldn't disable the processing on their end. So music would end up sounding just awful and it just wouldn't even come out half the time it would just filter most of it out as noise 
Um, and there was no way to defeat that on any kind of tablet or phone device. Um, and I really wanted it to work because Jitsi um, is very simple. It doesn't have any accounts. You can just type your, um, your room name and people can just connect uh, without sending links or anything else. And it had great sound quality. Uh, but unfortunately, without being able to disable the processing, uh, it was just unusable, at least for anything we'd be doing, or I would say that anything I'd be doing. So uh, what does all this frequency response mean, and why do we care about it? Um, really, this is telling us that Zoom, you know, isn't the most high fidelity. Uh, it sounds okay, uh, probably for most of our hearing. Uh, I know mine doesn't go much higher than 16K this last time I had it tested. Uh, there isn't as much low end, which is, you know, a bummer, but you know, think about where you're broadcasting to. Most people are listening on earbuds or uh, laptop speakers or tablets or anything else like that. So um, the the frequency response just isn't there. Um, yeah, there's really just not much to be done. Uh, the conclusion I came to with all this stuff as far as uh, what was the better service to use or what was the, um, well, who was the clear winner here? And it just came down to Zoom because everyone knows it, everyone uses it, and it's just simplicity. And unfortunately, convenience tends to win out over uh, audio quality a lot of the time, uh, except for a subset like folks like us, I suppose. Um, let's see, what else did I want to cover here? That's about it there. I did prepare a video uh, on YouTube with all these results. Let me go back to me here. There we are. Uh, and I have, uh, you can see a little more detail as far as what I did and here with the difference um, between Zoom and uh, I have some FaceTime audio and Jitsi on there, I think. Um, and you can hear them stacked up next to each other. So, questions? Hey, hey Lou, did you say yeah. there's more latency with original sound? There's less latency. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense because it would take more latency to add noise reduction and things like that. Yeah, that that, that makes sense. I, I just thought I may have you misspoke. said it the opposite. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I might have. No, you got it right, I think. I'll check the tape. Yeah, yeah, you'll be able to see it. <laughs> right. And and did you mean that it went from 357-ish, 357 milliseconds roughly down to 257 yeah right around okay. there it was about okay. 100 it was almost exact yeah. which i found interesting because yeah. that would say a fixed length dsp yeah cool anybody else questions i think that's really important what you're doing and it's really really neat to know what it says what 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 all of that means and uh, did you or are you able to test something like YouTube Live that is strictly a streaming? Oh, not? absolutely. If I stream to that, well, using this software I have lets me live stream anywhere. So um, yeah. I could pass it through YouTube and Facebook and things like that. Um, do you have that I think ability? they do have a bit. Yeah, I could do it to my own account and see what happens. I'm, I, as I've mentioned, I'm involved in the AES uh, convention planning, and I'm not specifically involved in the streaming or uh, what do you call it platform cho choosing they have said that they're going to be they they used uh, cadmium at the Vienna convention and there was something they weren't happy about in that and they're uh, fa it's mono mostly is the problem I think yeah and zoom is not enough capacity to hold as many people as are going to be involved. So they're searching around for something. But I've seen some YouTube Live, a couple of YouTube Live, and they sounded and looked great. So well, to me, the without thing with YouTube, knowing anything. The thing with YouTube Live, I think you have to actually have a certain number of subscribers or become some kind of partner in order to get access to certain amounts of uh, features on there. I don't know if that's accurate. It could be browser only that you can go live, but you can't do certain things. I remember reading it before, but I'll look into it some more. Okay. Hey, hey Lou, I don't, I don't know if yes, sir. I, I missed it or if you didn't say it, but what was your streaming software that you're using? Oh, I'm using vMix. Uh, I'm planning, I'm starting to make a little uh, video about this as well. This is uh, 
streaming software, I wanted to do it as digested by an audio engineer so that people want to use it can get <laughs> uh, an, an idea of it without speaking too much video jargon. Um, I'm trying not to be a video guy, but daggone it, they're dragging me in here. Um, but it makes it real easy. Once you have it all set up, you can just set your shots. I have a nice little stream deck I used to use for corporate audio stuff. And man, is it great to just put together a nice little presentation like this and be able to fly through all your stuff very easily. It's so I enjoy this. It's what you're doing. It's fun, it's too. Really nice. I mean, come it's on. It's really, really nice. Well, it's it supposed to be it's entertaining to watch. It is. Anybody else? Thank you. Great, thanks. This is killer. So thank you, everybody. We only went over time 20 minutes or 15 minutes or so, yeah, which was bad. remarkable. And Lou, thank you for letting us put you off so long. I, Rich's thing was really that was, was really fun. interesting. I'm out of work, yeah. man. I got nowhere to be. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> God, yeah. Yeah, really.